Sorry, folks, for the late start here. A couple of um, small technical issues, but here is Dwayne Charms. Okay, he is managing CPEs with Django and Celery. Take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry about the technical delays. Yeah, managing CPEs. What are we talking about here? Whenever you talk managing CPEs, you're going to have to talk about TR69. Now, I know most of you guys are very fortunate not to have to deal with this stuff. Um, so I'll give you guys a good introduction as to how TR69 works. We're then going to describe what got us into the situation of needing to manage all these CPEs, some design decisions, and of course the design never quite works the way you expected, so the challenges we encountered and some learning points. Right, what is TR69? It's the technical report number 69 by the Broadband Forum. It's a standard which is designed to manage and configure customer premises equipment, or CPEs, on an IP network. What does that mean? It's going to be managing things like ADSL routers. Okay. The fancy name for this, or the like, official name, is the CPE WAN Management Protocol. But the problem is that that kind of reduces down to CWMP or SWMP, which nobody really wants to pronounce. So everyone really knows it as TR69. Okay, other than ADSL routers, um, you've pretty much got all your internet gateway devices, so LTE modems, uh, WiMAX, uh, fiber ONTs, pretty much anything that gets you internet into your premises. In addition to that, it also has the ability to manage VoIP phones and things like uh, digital video set-top boxes. But for the most part, people use it for internet gateway devices. Why was TR69 brought into place? Well, like most standards, um, a group of people were not happy with what, how things were. They added a standard, and then there were more groups of people that weren't quite happy with how it was. <laughs> the primary purpose of TR69 is to prevent vendor lock-in. So the issue is that if you are an ISP, for example, and you buy devices, then if those devices are managed by product A and you want to buy more devices, you're going to have to get more things that are compatible with product A. So your vendors would basically have their devices and their management server. And once you pick a management server, that's it. You're going to buy those devices for the rest of your life because those management servers are expensive. So really a pain. It limits the choices for ISPs. And limited choices means poor competition. You can't select devices based on the features or the price points you want because you're stuck with the vendor you chose initially. In addition, the standard provides some guidelines, fairly strict guidelines, but not always strictly adhered to, for remote management. Whether this is a good thing or a bad thing depends on with which side of the do we need another standards debate you're on. Right, how does TR69 work? I talked about a management server. That management server is called the Auto Configuration Server, or ACS. The ACS needs to be reachable by all of your CPEs. Now, this presents a bit of a bootstrapping problem because if I buy a CPU off the shelf and plug it in, I don't have internet access. How is my ACS going to manage my CPE with no internet access? That's typically solved by the ISP flashing a preset firmware onto the device so that when the device comes up, it's in a guest or walled garden state. So it's got just enough internet access to get to the ACS, but not to get to the rest of the world. Communication happens over a SOAP and HTTP protocol. The, um, well, that design choice means you get to see a whole bunch of XML, which is ugly, but we'd have to deal with it. <laughs> right. Um, sessions, basically, a CPE will always be 
the start of a session. It'll send pretty much a web request to the ACS. The ACS then responds and says, oh, hi, I haven't seen you in a while. Here are the tasks that I need you to run. So those can be updating um, different values or settings on the uh, CPE. The CPE also has the option to say, hey, I just want to tell you about these few things. But that's not used particularly much other than, hey, I just want to tell you I finished downloading that file that you told me to download earlier. The problem is that CPE-initiated communication is a little bit annoying because it's always going to be a periodic thing and the ACS wants something to happen right now, not three hours from now when your periodic inform happens. So to work around that, the ACS can call a webhook. It's basically a single endpoint web server that's running on each CPE. And that just says, hey, can you please send me an inform? And the CPE will then start the session as usual. Right, I talked about modifying values on CPEs. How does this work? Basically, each device has a parameter hierarchy. Parameters are name value pairs. So essentially, it looks like a giant nested dict, except that it's all string handling and um, dot separated values and all kinds of things. The dot model is defined in TR98 which is kind of a, a sister standard to TR69. And your keys tend to look like that. Internet gateway device dot time dot NTP server. Fairly self-explanatory what that does. Of course, that's one of the shortest example parameters I could find. Um, it can get a little bit convoluted. So that's one of the standard ones. That's going to be on pretty much any device that you, um, that you look at. However, vendors have the option to extend the hierarchy by defining their own custom branches to, um, to the hierarchy. Okay, so that's TR69 in a pretty small nutshell. What does our, our problem look like? We've got an African ISP as a client in Central Africa. They run a big WiMAX network. Um, Dino was commenting to me yesterday, like, haven't heard about WiMAX in ages. It used to be like the next big thing and it's died out mostly here. They have an existing ACS, so they'd already kind of committed to, um, to a vendor on that. But because the um, the ACS implements TR69. They're not limited to friendly tech um, devices, so they can mix and match all of their customer CPEs. It's Africa. All of their processes are very manual. They've got a few guys who are kind of logging into devices and driving out to site, and a, a lot of physical work. Not good when you want to make big changes to your network. Also, they were experiencing a disconnect between billing and the real world. You'd have a device, it would have user A's credentials on it, then that device would get returned and then resent to a different client, but it would still have user A's credentials on it. So user A was getting the, the bill for it, but user B was using the device. There were a couple of dis different scenarios where, in which they were managing to get this to happen. Um, and obviously, people weren't particularly happy about it. Okay, also, part of the environment is African-level power supply. Um, it's worse than ESCOM. So often we'd say, hey guys, it looks like only half your CPEs are online. And they're like, yeah, it's fine. One of the big cities has no power. Um, yeah, it's, it makes it interesting when you need to get hold of CPEs and they're just not responding. Okay, what were the client's requirements? They needed their billing server to be able to hit a simple um, REST API and provision or deprovision devices. So restore them to their original walled garden guest-only access and also device comes online, 
we see, hey, this serial number has just been sold to this client, send it to that client's credentials. Basically, the user needs to interact or doesn't need to interact with any form of admin interface. Right, that was the primary thing. And then while we were at it, they were like, mm, can we fix these manual processes that we keep going through? Can we get some bulk handling of CPEs? So that includes firmware upgrades. There were some really old and slightly dodgy firmwares running on, um, on some of their CPEs. So being able to report and then upgrade those in large batches. And then also, they wanted to add a new frequency to their network. So they had three frequency bands that they were using. They needed to add a fourth. This would involve logging into every single CPE manually and changing values. Not a fun time. So we also ended up helping them with that. And then improved visibility. What's going on on our network? How, how many devices, um, or when last were these devices seen? So often they'd have a device that for three months hadn't been online. Call up the customer going, hey, like, do you still use our service? Okay, design. Um, on the ACS communication side, I talked about SOAP and the horror that is XML. Zeep is a great little library. Um, it takes most of the pain out of it and makes it feel like you're just talking to another Python class. Um, however, ACS calls are slow, like um, you'd think they're using uh, carrier pigeons somewhere in their queue because it's a good request takes over a second, bad requests can be 10 plus seconds. So really painful. If you want to iterate over your entire um, fleet of CPEs, it's going to take you several hours. So obviously we can't have synchronous calls to the ACS. And what do you do when you need async? You put a little celery on it. Um, it's kind of the de facto asynchronous solution. Right, then we're talking about the TR69 parameters. I mentioned that vendors can define their own branches to, um, in the parameter hierarchy. And they do. And those branches vary wildly. Um, it's not just what the branch name is, it's what the leaves look like. And this varies across vendors, and that's kind of to be expected. It varies across models, and in the really annoying cases, it varies across firmwares. You'll upgrade a device and suddenly it doesn't really talk the same language it used to. So, solution to that is you've got to keep track of what all of these um, how all of these devices have their parameters assigned. And we did that with parameter maps. It's, it's a simple mapping of these are the fields that we're interested, so username, password, frequencies, etc. And this is the parameter name that goes with it. Not too complicated, um, but basically all the ACS calls then just need to do that little translation step for a, a map. And then because of the slowness, we also cache all, all the things that we fetch from the CPE, we cache locally. So a little bit of database going on there. And then web and API frameworks. Um, we needed an API to face billing. It was kind of a tiny four-point API. So nothing too complex there. And then a front end for configuration and also giving them some visibility. Part of configuration is these parameter maps. You've got to set them up per device and firmware. So when you onboard a new firmware, you go, OK, let's search for parameters that I, um, that I need. So you search frequency and says, these parameter names have the word frequency in them. Pick the one that looks like the one you want to use. You build it up from there. And then that's that firmware version onboarded for the rest of time. So only one off per firmware. To get all of this to work, obviously you need a bit of an ORM. And partly because of previous experience, partly because it's got batteries included, Django seemed a, a fairly natural choice to us. Okay. Um, on the deployment side, 
We run it behind G-Unicorn and Nginx, they're fairly standard options, to make sure things stay running. Um, both Celery and the G-Unicorn stuff were wrapped inside of systemd service units, makes it easier for the starting and the stopping. And at Featherlight Consulting, we love salt stack. Um, <laughs> I've heard a couple of people talk Ansible. We enjoy our salt stack quite a bit more. Um, but it's a configuration management system. Very nice, a declarative, this is the state my system should be in, make it happen, rather than please run these commands. Also, Sentry, I heard Hinek talking about it yesterday as well. It's really nice to make sure you've got visibility on your, all your errors. If you get the ACS freaking out over something, it'll pop up, and that helped us debug a couple of more ephemeral issues. So, challenges, the promise of standards. It'll be great. They'll, everyone will be able to talk the same language and be interoperable. It'll be easy. No, it was a lie. It's not just parameter name differences. We, th we saw the parameter name distance differences coming from a distance and planned for it. But then we found out that everything was getting stored differently as well. Usernames. In one system, you'll have a username leaf that is simply user at example.net. Sweet, that can work. On another one, sorry, we don't have user at example.net. We'll separate username into user and example.net. Frequencies. Let's just add one more frequency to the list of tables of um, frequencies that are scanned. Okay, it's easy. On one device, comma separated list. On another device, 20 empty rules, and you've got to push your values to insert rule, and it will then not update insert rule. Insert rule just kind of stays there, and it'll add the next rule in rule XX, which is great. It's completely not the standard. We kind of um, talked to the one vendor as to how do we get this to work. I'd like because um, we were having some trouble on the certain firmware version, because that firmware version didn't actually work with the thing that they put in. And the response was pr basically, no, it, that's not how the standard works, we won't support it, just deal with it. Anyway, good thing we had a way to upgrade all the firmwares. Okay, other ACS weirdness, there's some Java in the friendly tech ACS, and I'm not sure what they're doing, but they sometimes sent us the wrong SOAP response types. We'd say, please send me your firmware version, and we'd get device info back. I couldn't understand what was happening. It was only happening when we were doing bulk celery tasks, so fire off a couple thousand tasks, and suddenly we see on Sentry, hey, a third of your tasks failed. Turns out, the ACS API was clobbering our request context. It would basically just receive requests and send responses and not really bother as to which request matched up with which response. <laughs> so we ended up just saying, no, we're going to keep this simple. Um, skip the whole concurrency concept with Celery and use a single worker. That way we don't overwhelm the ACS. Okay. Learning points, vendors will not do the right thing. You've got a plan for both what you think should happen and anything that might happen. Expect the unexpected. Right, um, if you're using SOAP, reach for Zeep. It really is a pleasant experience. Um, only minor niggle we had is that if you look inside the, um, the WSDL for what format a specific request expects, sometimes the format doesn't quite line up with what you, the format that you have to send to Zip. Um, that tends to be with, how can I explain it? You're sending, you're expecting to send a list, but you actually need to send a list of dicts with type specified per variable. But it's one minor caveat to an otherwise really pleasant to use library. 
Okay, if you want to make your service concurrent, make sure that you check that your upstream services are concurrent first. Um, otherwise, things can break in unexpected ways. Fortunately for us, it was fairly easy to see it in Sentry and it popped up immediately. But a, a less prominent problem may bite you in the back further down the line. And Sentry, great tool, gives you visibility, especially when you're running background tasks. See what's happening before your users start complaining. Right, and that's all. I think we've managed to catch up the late technical start time. Are there any questions? Hi. Um, what was the Django part used for? Okay, so Django provides both uh, the API, so just simple endpoints for billing to hit. So billing says, please deprovision this serial number. Django then translates that. Also, front-end needed for configuration systems. So setting up your in initial parameter maps is a unfortunately manual, but someone's got to do it point-and-click kind of approach. Also, reporting in terms of when last devices were online, things like that. So would that have scaled to, say, 200,000 CP devices? The biggest problem with that is the ACS's ability to um, to scale. I think that we'd need a bit of a, a rethink as to what happens on the ACS side. Um, on our side, we could scale up the concurrency without too much trouble. Um, but yes, the, the fact that the ACS can handle a single request at a time is a serious problem. Um, we mask the latency or the, yeah, the fact that everything's very slow, we mask it with Celery, but realistically that queue is still taking a couple of hours to run down if you're applying operations across the entire fleet. <laughs> uh, and the scope for replacing the ACS completely and just going directly to the CP devices? So that would involve writing your own ACS. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So I wouldn't like to do that. That sounds like pain. Um, however, most ACSs do provide a northbound interface for the API calls that we're making to them. So it shouldn't be a particularly large amount of work to swap out the API that we have to the ACS currently with a different vendor's API. So on that front, definitely doable. What was, hello. What was the um, Q backend that you were using uh, with Celery? Um, so we used the RabbitMQ. Okay. Um, yeah, Q. I have a question. Uh, what was the uh, mystery African country using all this WiMAX? Um, so the country is Malawi. Um, yeah, I can't tell you the ISP, but yeah, <laughs> Google Malawi WiMAX and you'll probably find it. <laughs>